My name is Dalia Borsche and I'm really excited to uh, introduce our next speaker, Salome Vögelin. She's an artist and a writer dealing with the aesthetic, social and political realities of sound worlds and with listening as a socio-political practice of sound. Above, she's a reader in sound arts at the London College of Communication at the Univers University of Arts. And I've been following her work since I first read her book, Listening to Noise and si Silence, that came out in 2010. And uh, last year, um, I met her first time in person at her presentation of her most recent book, The Political Possibilities of Sound, and I immediately invited her over to CDM Festival, not only to contribute to the discourse program, but also to write an article to our magazine um, that I I highly recommend to, um, to get and read. Um, it's um, a magazine with several articles and interviews that elaborates um, on various um, topics connected to our festival theme, Persistence. And Salome is uh, now with her lecture performance continuing on this um, thought of uh, resisting resilience. Um, so, uh, unperforming resilience, and I'm really excited what we will hear. Welcome, Salome. Thank you, Dahlia, for inviting me, and Emily for making it possible for me to come here, I wish to travel, and I'm going to try and unperform resilience. Resilience, 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 resilience. Resilience, 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 resilience. Resilience, according to Mark Neoclus, describes the capacity of a system to return to a previous state, to recover from shock or to bounce back after a crisis or trauma. It is a signifier of individual strength and autonomy that interprets elasticity as compliance. To accept low wages, precarity, uncertainty, disaster and even war. And it demands you withstand it on your own two feet, without the help of social infrastructure, but through training, rigorous preparation and anticipation instead. To be ready to accept and make do, rather than have the capacity to resist and push back, or to imagine and demand other possibilities. Resilience in this sense is our capitulation and the acceptance of an inequitable and insecure world. It perverts the notion of elasticity and responsiveness into the tolerance of the intolerable and justifies the withdrawals of state aid and welfare networks by transferring blame and accountability from the collective, the state and society onto the individual. Repeating resilience over and over on your tiptoes, however, trips the word up, trips, the word trips over its own vowels and consonants. The repetition erases its certainty and demand and creates a different emphasis. Resilient, 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 resilient. Resilient, 
resilient, resilient, resilient, resilient, resilient, resilient, resilient, resilient, resilient, resilient, resilient, resilient, resilient, resilient, resilient, resilient, resilient, resilient, resilient. In its performance on bare and unsteady tiptoes, the focus of a lexical and certain interpretation and use slips up, and the dubious economic elasticity becomes apparent. Stuttering and teetering vowels and syncopated consonants break the rhythm of a naturalized reading, its desired bounciness, and to make room for doubt and reinterpretation. And so my shaky repetitions reveal resilience as a concurrent neoliberal response to asymmetrical resourcing, focused not on solutions of care and redistribution to confront inequities, but articulating precarity and the demand on the individual to self-care and to become an entrepreneur of the self to always prepare and be ready for the tolerance of an intolerable world. Resilience, 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 resilience. Resilience, 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 resilience. My voice repeatedly performing the word aloud on shaky tiptoes demonstrates not the elasticity of compliance of a compliant individual, but the radical elasticity of sound that holds the capacity for resistance and the imagination of other possibilities. Sound is elastic, formless, bendy. It says elasticity performs a radical non-compliance. It does not obey the neoliberal signifier and demand, but asserts and practices my body as breath, as voice, as sound, as an unstable contact in touch and touched by others, relational, reciprocal, social. Resilience, 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 resilience. Resilience, 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 resilience. In the breathy enunciation of ease and eyes without language as a certain frame to lean on rests another meaning, that of failure and vulnerability, which become radical efforts of resistance in an unequal world. And in the fragile breath of their open sounds, politics finds another imagination, that of a shared existence and responsibility performed in the acknowledgement that there is no independent self, but that every I and everything is made of non-I and non-thing elements.
Drown. Drown down. Drown down own. Drown down own one. Drown down own one. Someone. Join. 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 I am going to be to going. Am I joy? Joy. Joy. Talk. Talk. Take these words and make some sense for you. 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 The time and space of breathing opens new possibilities. Its physicality questions a lexical sense, and its silence enables another response. The practice of silent voices in the space of breathing opens politics to the possibility of a political that has a different imaginary and a different elasticity that is social, a bending together to our needs rather than economic necessities. Resilience, 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 resilience. Resilience, 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 resilience. My tiptoed voice, repeating resilience 100 times, articulates between body and breath and sounds the codependence of oxygen and the sun, of trees and water, life and things. Thus it brings home the need for collaboration and participation and sounds an elasticity that is not resilient as in compliant but expansive and contingent voluminous and viscid, like the honey Maurice Merleau-Ponty speaks of. This is the case with the quality of being honeyed. Honey is a slow-moving liquid. While it undoubtedly has a certain consistency and allows itself to be grasped, it soon creeps slyly from the fingers and returns to where it started from. It comes apart as soon as it has been given a particular shape, and what is more, it reverses the roles by grasping the hands of whoever would take hold of it. The living, exploring hand which thought it could master this thing instead discovers that it is embroiled in a sticky external object. Thus the world as honeyed breath creates not separate things, the toucher and the touched, but an invisible volume, 
This volume is not, is not the measure of decibels, but the expanse of a sonic world. This is a space not defined and bounded by walls, ceilings, windows and floors, but is the indivisible sphere of sonic interbeing. <sighs> My sound sounds with the walls, with you, with the chairs and the floor and the ceiling. It is not my sound, it is our sound. It is a voluminous capacity generated by a collective sounding and listening. It is not a capacity to endure, but the capacity of interaction and the possibility of a shared cosmos. In its repeated performance, Resilience rethinks the neoliberalist adaptability of the individual in the invisible volume of sound. It's visit dimensionality, where responsibility is not individuated, but a matter of interbeing, as being off and with each other, not this or that, but this with that and of that. Indivisibly sounding a shared cosmos, and where weakness is not overcome, but listened to, sounded, and heard in the oxygen that connects us all. The volume of Tigerbalm is sensuous and expansive. 
Its elasticity performs honey's liquid embrace, viscid and reciprocal. It sounds not this or that, but with everything. It does not create one singular reality, a space apart from us with boundaries and a name. Instead, it configures its possibilities as a shared cosmos, practicing silent voices as plural voices in the volume of the tiger's breath, inviting a plural hearing. According to Mark Thatcher and Vivian R. Schmidt, writing on resilient liberalism in Europe's political economy, resilience is, and I quote, perceived as the only legitimate course of action, unquote. It pretends to allow for diversity and plurality. Everybody can be resilient. While remaining the only possibility, everybody has to be resilient. We accept this demand as it presents a simple solution. She must learn resilience. While not questioning its unyielding elasticity, whose flexibility is not a sign of its conceding and reciprocal intent, but the rationality of its control, by contrast, the sounds of our unperforming resilience are irrational in relation to the world's neoliberal aim. Its enunciations do not move on a horizontal chain of meaning and association, but dive into the depth of contingent articulation. They produce a verticality of sense and linger in an elastic expanse that is that of sound rather than of compliance. How we do not hear, here we do not hear the rhetoric of one truth and the demand of its reality, but plural possibilities that initiate other ways to live. Where she does not have to learn to be more resilient, but comes to resist the cause of her pain. In that sense, sound is a novel source for a radical critique and agitation of resilience that as a neoliberal signifier enslaves and blames us individually, but that as repeated utterance creates a voluminous expanse and makes us responsible together. Sound, a sonic sensibility, does not provide the consciousness of a counter-resilience, but enables its unperforming, its re-articulating, its re-uttering in bits and pieces of separate vowels and consonants that form a volume which we can inhabit together in a contingent process of co-constitution, trying at least to listen out for and participate in a more equitable world.
As I listen to the undulating voices, breathing words, and moving sounds of Josie de Oliveiro's Astoria 4, I follow her explanation. And I quote, the performer's role is not to make the text understandable, but to use it as a key for the phoneme selection, singing as slowly as possible as a tape that has been played backwards in a slower rotation, unquote. The piece turns two voices around the deck, around the mouth, in slow rotation, articulating between Portuguese, Sanskrit and Japanese expressions, a language that is nobody's and everybody's, that in its turning undulation explores and performs the sonorous depth of words rather than the horizontal connection in language, and that sounds without recourse to semantic certainties and other possibility of sense. The sound created between the two voices, electronic violin, bass, guitar and percussion, is elastic without being compliant. It does not adapt, but formlessly forms another imagination of music, of instrumentation, as well as of the body, and in an extension also of the political, understood as the governance of interaction and living together. It creates communication as a viscous thread that repeats and returns again and again to the same juncture without saying the same, but pointing at the infinity of expression and the impossibility of a direct exchange. This impossibility is not the work's failure, but its desire for a plural voice, and its infinity is not a sign of the work's resilience, but the continuation and expanse of its visit, material, and song. Performing an elastic sound. Sit on the floor and hum your employment contract. Thank you. Thank you so much, Salome, for your inspiring talk. Um, are there any questions from the audience right now? Otherwise, I can start. Um, well, um, what I really liked is that you posed um, failure and vulnerability as um, very intimate but yet radical possibilities of resistance. Um, I really like this idea. Uh, in addition to the idea of angriness um, we heard before, so there are many ways out of the uh, um, resilience. And 
Um, you proposed uh, listening practices. Um, that could be an answer maybe to the forms of music consumption we heard in the talk from Paul Rackroyd this morning. Um, and connecting to Robin James, you um, uh, yeah, proposed an idea of resilience that shouldn't aim at um, taking care for uh, economic needs, but taking care for us, uh, taking care for everybody and uh, instead of uh, self-care. Um, you proposed an opposition, um, maybe that was in your article as well, uh, between the contingency of a sound and the certainty of, uh, um, the semantic certainty of uh, words. And I wonder if this really is an opposition at all, because um, sound can be very distinct too, and words can be very um, contingent as well. So maybe. You yeah, I th if I remember rightly, I think the difference I'm trying to make, and I make the difference, I think, via Jean-Luc Nancy, I'm not sure now at the moment, but it's this difference of if I say a word that, that I say because I really mean it's semantic meaning and I'm not bothered about how I say it or what it sounds like, or I'm, I'm teasing out just that semantic meaning. I don't think we, all, we ever can actually do that. There's always rings with any word that the sonorous. But what if we could switch off the semantic and we would just hear, like the suggestion of humming the employment contract is the suggestion that you don't look at the words of what you're told to do and what you get given in exchange for what you're told to do, but you hum it. So what is in it when we hum it? What is in the sonorous? As a, as a, that gives us the ability to sort of reassess, because I think it's interesting to suggest where we should not be resilient then. Ultimately, we should, we should kind of resist and, and find resistance. And the, and, and the problem with being resilient is that we spend so much time being resilient that we don't have the energy to transform, change, demand change, or even to get together and say, well, this is not how we all want it, because resilience also makes you very individuated. Well, you know, so, well, I, I can survive, I don't know why he can't, I'm fine, I'm fine. You know, that kind of, that kind of sense, I'm all right. And, and so I think in the sonorous, there is something we could all hum together, we could all make, you know, this sound I made in this room, trying to explain that it is a volume rather than a room, we could all do it together, and really sense that we are, that we are together in the sonorous of this room when it's not an architectural sign. Um, and another question um, I would like to ask is, um, you proposed, to, um, as well as the other speakers actually, um, to overcome this um, idea of individuality in a sense of togetherness and listening in this volume, um, sonic volume. Um, what about subjectivity? Um, is, is there a, a difference between individuality and subjectivity? Because I think like, especially while listening, Subjectivity um, plays a big role, in, you know, mm. like listening is always uh, subject, subjective. So yeah, I don't think that being individuated means you respect sub a diversity of subjectivities. It actually means you only respect your own, or you're only really, so f you have to focus so much because of the pressure put on you on, I must survive, I must have enough money in the back, I must be able to pay this, and nobody's gonna take care of me. That actually you haven't even got time to think about subjectivity, probably not even your own. And, but I think working together, and obviously I mean sort of making sounds together, making music together is one form of, of a kind of practical, practical doing stuff together. You, you have to immediately engage in, in diversity and you have to in immediately engage in subjectivities because we all, you, you can't assume or you don't assume. I mean, that's something else I really like about sound, that it might not fulfill that entirely, but at least you don't, we, we together exist in a very different relationship in sounds. We're making sounds at each other, but it's not about you and it's not about me, it's about this voluminous space in between us. And so we only exist now in this encounter, sonically speaking. And so prejudices or notions of, of, of subjectivities Find, have it much harder to survive because we really have to contingently generate who we think we are and who we think our vis-a-vis -vis is. And that, so I think no subjectivity comes into it, but not as categories, but as something we will have to perform and practice. Thank you. Are there any questions from the audience? There's one. Hi, hello, does it work? Yeah, 
Uh, I don't quite have a question. I just want to thank you a lot for breaking up that uh, word of uh, resilience. Uh, I've had a suspicion about that for, for many years now that I thought that's one of the terms we need to co compost maybe. And um, it's uh, part of a vocabulary that is dished out by the neoliberal uh, through the military to the academia and to the art world. And resistance, I feel, is also one of those. And those words that are circulate that keep us in a place that we don't want to be. Mm. Like we are against what we don't want to be, it comes back to us. So we colonize and decolonize and we keep just circulating the same concept. And I really appreciate the idea of sound that would take us away. But I think we all need to think much more about what do we want to see and what language would we use to describe or to get to where we want to, to what we want to see, what our story would be rather than mm. uh, circulate those terms that are interrogating or this, you know, all those military words that we are using. Yeah. How can we tell new stories with those words? So maybe with the sounds. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks. There's a question. Um, that was working. All right. Uh, you talk about something that we can make uh, instead of being resilient. I would like to hear something from you about uh, the way we perceive things and the way the perception of things uh, in individuality affects uh, the way we live, in fact. And we relate to each other and all of this, basically. That's a bit big. <laughs> so what do you mean? <laughs> what do you mean exactly? How uh, I think how we relate to each other is reassessed in sound? Uh, I mean, making something like sound or whatever, basically, uh, it's something that I express to the world, but there's a lot of stuff going on that is something that the world uh, expressed to me, how to say, that is perception, basically. And uh, I think there's a way of living that is to be too much focused on what we see or on what we get concentrated on. And uh, I believe sound can be a way to avoid it and to get into the world, you know what I mean? Like uh, being not an individual, but something that goes with the flow, how to say. Yeah. And so there's, you were talking about something that we can make. But I would like to know if you think there's some way we can try to change our perception of things. Okay. Well, I'm re obviously I'm really interested in sound. Um, and I'm really interested in sound not be only because of sound. Um, I think be but because of its invisibility and because of its indivisibility. And that we can't, with sound, we can't make visual maps as easily with sound because it just wouldn't obey those black little lines we have on a flat 2D piece of paper. It actually doesn't obey, um, not even not the military words, but also not the military geographical infrastructure of how we portray the world. And that's almost just a metaphor for, I think, I don't have a problem with looking and, and what we can see per se, but I have a problem with how we look, I suppose. And I hope that, you know, the look, our look is very pragmatic pragmatic, very focused on achieving something. It's focused on this or that, not that thing in between. And it's the thing in between that interests me. And I think that's where a different vision can come from. So through sound, not to get to a not looking, but actually to a different vision where we see how things, rather than seeing the separation, seeing how things relate and how things interact and that they're constituted, we are probably more constituted in that space here between us than we are in, in a kind of 
visual autonomy of outline and, and, and visually perceived bodies that we can separate from each other. So I'm interested in that as a consciousness and, and how we could think about that, how we, if we could really go through the world thinking about how things connect rather than how they're separate, what impact would that have on our language? Because our language is very de dependent on differences, that this word isn't that word, that's sort of the premise of, of being able to talk at all. Or maps or architectural drawings, anything is dependent on being able to see where it is not and where the outside of the house is or where the outside of the country is, where the border is. And I, yes, yeah, so I think obviously we're all here because we're interested in sound and I think there is something for me that goes beyond sound art or beyond music into a sort of a daily a practicing of the world within that that interests me or that I think is 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 kind of a fruitful way, hopefully. There was another question. Um, um. Hello. Um, thank you so much for this talk. It was filled with concepts and phrases that will stay with me for a really long time, so I'm genuinely grateful. Um, as I was trying to enter some of these examples that you proposed to us of sound, which is voluminous and spherical that we might enter and co-constitute together, I was really struck by how different it was for me as a participant, as a witness, to watch you struggle with your own physicality, your own limitations, the variations of your breath and voice as they were all interacting, versus my attempt to co-constitute and inhabit pre-recorded examples that, though they of course had fragility in the moment of their capture, they're nevertheless designed to be things that can be reproduced with a certain amount of consistency. And I was just wondering if you think that the sort of radical potential in this vulnerability or the, the potential to, the pressures of, of this navigating a sonic sphere together and, and having to find our own plural ways through it, is there more pressure and more in the in the variance and the fragility of live performance, do you think, than in pre-recorded objects like you shared or environments like you shared? Well, I, I really hate performing and that's why I think I have to do it. When I played the piano, I always did the accompaniment because you could hide and you wouldn't be there. But I think because it is so horrible to do, and to, you know, take off your shoes, stand in front of people you don't know, and, you know, go on your tiptoes. And I, and I, but I think that's why there is something in there for me. I mean, I, I don't think it's a masochistic streak. I think it's genuinely something about the vulnerability, of opening up a vulnerability to a different discourse and a different exchange. And obviously, in an ideal m world, maybe now we would have a workshop where we'd all take our shoes off and we'd all go out on our tiptoes and we'd all do it together. You know, I, I appreciate that this is still a very contrived thing and I'm even up a few steps and I, you know, I'm separated in that sort of way. But I think I see it as an invitation for, for, for everybody to go and tiptoes and take their shoes off and feel, feel vulnerable and, that it's, and that, that that's okay. And I think, yes, the recordings, obviously, I say, although I have to really apologize, I think one record didn't, so I have to travel quite so well. Um, I must have a scratch. Um, and I think records are probably have, have that as well. They're, they're, they're kind of physical. If I'd played an MP3, it wouldn't sound as nice, but it wouldn't have had a scratch. Um, but I assume that the performances the, the people did who did the work, that also entailed a sort of a vulnerability of putting something out there that is not entirely controllable. But I've no idea whether that answered your question. No. <laughs> Hi, thank you for the talk. It, um, yeah, I made up really many suggestions uh, which I like very much uh, that we could get in a flow with that topic, kind of. Um, but one of these suggestions from my side is that there is some kind of moral, um, um, yeah, that, that you that you kind of say that there is something particularly good about this elastic sound, which I don't understand because. Um, the elasticity, the sound is ubiquitous, of course, it's transformative, transversal, and so on. But these are also lies and excuses of dictators or 
um, uh, spirituality that we find out is getting cruel or whatever. Like, there is, I don't see a reason there for such a, a, a moral evaluation of, of sound and of, of elasticity and yeah, I think it's, it, it always, it just, I mean, yeah, of course sound connects and it's something, it might be something passive and it might be harder to, to turn that in a weapon, but that already happened too. So I think it really depends on which, yeah, which aim we follow by using sound. So what, what do you say about that? Well, I hope, I mean, I don't think I'm taking a moral position, if anything. You know, I might engage in, a, in, a, in an ethics or in a, okay. pra in a practice of ethics as a participatory ethics, but I'm sure, certainly not taking a moral position. The reason I talk about elasticity in this context is because resilience sells itself as elasticity. It's one of its other words, elasticity, flexibility, when in actual fact it is a compliance, meaning the elastic has to bend around the shape that somebody else wants it to. So it's in my, in my opinion, it's not a true elasticity. It is our ability to be elastic that is abused in order to deal with um, the neglect of the welfare state or disasters, um, et cetera, et cetera. So, if I would then make an argument, well, what we need is an is a, is a anti-elasticity or a counter-elasticity, then I might be talking about the rigidity. And I don't think that would work, or that wouldn't work for me in this kind of argument and in this playing out, which is obviously also elastic and contingent. Um, but because I would just go against the elasticity, and I don't really believe in a politics of the antis, because the politics of the antis, or even the aesthetics of the antis, is always already embedded in the power game of that which it is anti. And I sort of think it can never get out of that, and it becomes very, it becomes very desperate because it just becomes subsumed. Whereas I think, no, hang on, sound is actually elastic. It truly goes all sorts of paths. Sometimes we don't want it wanted to go all sorts of paths because our neighbors have a party and we don't actually want to hear it. So it's not necessarily always a positive, but it is one of its characters. So how about looking into that elasticity and whether that elasticity can out-elasticize the elasticity of resilience. And I think that's kind of what I try to perform. Can we unperform rather than anti-perform resilience through the elasticity of sound? not only a sound, but as an invisible sensibility or a sensibility to the invisible and the indivisible. Okay, I think there were really nice closing words. Mm -hmm. And if there are not any more questions from the audience, then I want to thank you again, Salome, you. for your inspiring talk.